Theodore Weissenbuhl Adorno is, of course, one of the great thinkers of the 20th century. Um, he is known for being, in the, in the uh, words of uh, Herbert Marcuse, a genius. He was the kind of man that uh, touched on just about every subject you can think of uh, in terms of art and uh, aesthetics. But he, of course, also ventures into the science of society and is known for his uh, cooperative work and on the authoritarian personality and other social analysis. However, more than half of his work deals with the emancipatory character of music. In fact, more than half of his work, still much of it untranslated, uh, deals with the question of aesthetic, specifically music. I'm going to focus on one of his essays, which is probably one of the better essays, because he deals with his dialogue with Walter Benjamin, his uh, friend um, and colleague, and, uh, who's known for his uh, work um, called uh, the, the Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. Walter Benjamin uh, died in 1940. Um, I committed suicide because he was afraid of being uh, caught by the Nazis. And uh, this is um, a series of letters and correspondence between Walter Benjamin and Theodore Adorno. And, uh, but principally, because the correspondence stopped as a result of Benjamin's death, the uh, essay that Adorno wrote in response to Benjamin's work on modern art. So I'll try to uh, discuss the question of Adorno and Benjamin in their relationship with art and their view of uh, art in the modern world. Uh, keep in mind that uh, uh, the essay were written at a time when the Nazis had taken over power and uh, uh, both of them lived in the, under some of the most uh, uh, intense um, agony and uh, anxiety. So, but nevertheless, uh, their essays uh, are still very much with us today, and as somebody once said, one can consider Adorno's work, uh, or for that matter, even Benjamin's, um, to be uh, wrong uh, or misguided, but nevertheless, one can never possibly ignore their work, and uh, that's where Adorno really stands today, is one of the most... Uh, incredibly controversial uh, figures of the 20th century and uh, in the 21st century. His words, his ideas still resonate very powerfully uh, without missing a beat, no pun intended. I will focus on just one of his essay, um, and I, but I will also quote uh, Benjamin's uh, work on uh, the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. Uh, Adorno's essay is called On the Fetish Character in Music and the Regression of Listening, written in 1938. I thank the uh, uh, author of Essays on Music, uh, a, a Selected Works uh, with Introduction and Commentary and notes by Richard Leppert uh, with translation, new translation by Susan Gillespie. On the fetish character in music and the regression of listening is an extraordinary and wide-ranging essay less about listening and more about the social conditions affecting listening and the impact of this listening conditions on music's relation to subjects. The essay is a result of a critical exchange of ideas between Adorno and Walter Benjamin in the form of several 
lengthy letters sent by Benjamin from his exile in Paris and by Adorno from his exile first in London and Oxford and, and later in New York. The so-named, quote, Adorno-Benjamin debate, unquote, whose story, long and complicated, constitutes one of the most important discussion of aesthetics produced in the 20th century. We want to trace the essentials of just one part of it, namely the exchanges triggered by Benjamin's essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, which first appeared in print in the Institute of Social Research Journal in French translation in 1936. First reference uh, to this essay occurs in the adorno benjamin correspondence in a passing reference by Benjamin in January 1936, by which time the essay was already fully drafted. Though Adorno hadn't yet seen it, um, on February 27, 1936, Benjamin sent Adorno a copy in German, together with um, an accompanying letter. Three weeks later, on uh, 18 of March, Adorno responded with a detailed and lengthy critique, which would culminate two years later with the publication of the fetish character essay written in New York, references to which uh, thereafter continue to appear in the correspondence as later as the penultimate letter to Adorno by Benjamin, written a few months before his suicide in September 1940. Benjamin's concern stated in his essay's preface is a theory of mass art, quote, useless for the purpose of fascism, unquote, and useless by contrast, quote, for the formulation of revolutionary demands in the politics of art." Unquote. His argument hinges on the claim that modern reproductive technology in the realm of mass entertainment, art, film, especially fundamentally alters the cultural landscape in socially progressive ways, less by making mass art more or less democratically available and inexpensive more by the changed conditions of viewing engendered by the medium. Benjamin's point of departure is a comparison of two ways of viewing two different types of art. Relatively private viewing of unique original artworks, paintings, on the one hand, and on the other, communal or mass viewing of mass art, that is, film of which there are uh, any number of reproduced prints, but in essence, no original. Whereas paintings demand contemplation under ritualized viewing conditions, film, by contrast, invites distractions. Films tend toward a high degree of referentiality, plot, narrative, settings, and bodies in gestural relationships, not to downplay the indexical photographic image as such. Movies, in short, were sufficiently like life, that their reception no longer required rapt contemplation. They would be received by viewers as already familiar, rather like acetate acquaintances and the settings in which they were watched communally and cheaply did not inspire or, or for that matter, ritual silence. Audience interaction of the Rocky Horror type was not wholly an invention of the 1970s. An original artwork was available only under the special circumstances permitted by the established protocols and at a single viewing site, and these conditions of viewing gave the work cult value and the quality of unapproachability. True to its nature, it remains distant, however close it may be. The film, lacking an original rendered moot, the protocol of referential respect, for all intents and purposes. Reproducibility, in Benjamin's words, replaced authenticity 
What withered with the film was the artwork's aura. That's A-U-R-A, the aura. A word Benjamin places in scare quotes at its first appearance. Film advances, quote, the liquidation of the traditional value of the cultural heritage, unquote which Benjamin reads as a political progressive diminution of privilege and intellectual domination. The spatial, as in spatial, S-P-A-T-I-A-L, as in space, spatial element resurfaces here. Benjamin speaks of the masses, desire to bring things closer, spatially and humanely. In essence, to have what has been denied them, freeing itself from ritual, the mechanistically reproduced artwork, quote, begins to be based on another practice, politics. Mechanical reproduction of art changes the reaction of the masses toward art. The reactionary attitude toward a Picasso painting changes into the progressive rea- uh, reaction toward a Chaplin movie. The progressive reaction is characterized by the direct, intimate fusion of visual and emotional enjoyment with the orientation of the expert. Such fusion is of a great social significance. Unquote. So basically what uh, uh, Benjamin here says is uh, that film is simply more uh, democratic than, let's say, going to a museum and uh, contemplating over the oral uh, element of great works of art. Benjamin is especially attracted to montage and to the shock effects that can result from the technique, which he judges anti orotic Again, anti orotic that's A-U-R-A-T-I-C, as in aura, and functioning against both contemplation. One doesn't contemplate when shocked, and passivity, shock, can be ignored. Put differently, so as to square the circle, shock is distracting. And here Adorno learns from his friend Bertolt Brecht, shock alienates and estranges. Accordingly, the viewer must actively attempt to make sense of what's happening. The viewer becomes a critic instead of a worshipper or believer. Benjamin employs distraction as a mark of expertise among the masses. He signals the habitual. That is, distraction implies a level of expertise to which the mechanically reproduced artwork can appeal yet without colonizing the viewer. In other words, the viewer's interpretive agency is implicitly valorized by film and also, as it were, protected through the replacement of aura by distraction. By honoring this agency, film honors the masses as subjects and at the same time contributes to their subjecthood. The public is placed in the position of the critic, but... Quote, this position requires no attention. The public is an examiner, but an absent-minded one, unquote. Now, it was in this case, the public would not be enslaved to uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the projection of the film, in essence, uh, is 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 egalitarian as compared to uh, classical artworks, which tend to be uh, m- more aristocratic and therefore in a more dominant position. So, in essence, what he's saying is that uh, film uh, kind of uh, becomes uh, a kind of a popular form of art. It it. Uh, lowers itself to the masses rather than the masses, in, in essence, having to climb up to appreciate uh, the greater works of art. In response, and referring to the study as extraordinary, 
Theodore Adorno tells Benjamin that, quote, there is not a single sentence here that I would not want to discuss with you in detail. Unquote. Uh, here, Adorno, of course, totally disagrees with Walter Benjamin. He finds uh, the uh, analysis by Benjamin to be quite uh, uh, against what he considers to be uh, uh, a misguided view, as much as he admired Benjamin. <clears throat> Barring that possibility, Adorno identifies one fundamental theme, his passionate interest and total approval of Benjamin's intention to demythify art, adding that his own work emphatically endorses, quote, the primacy of modern technology, especially music. He then begins to elucidate his objection, which may be summarized as follows. First, Benjamin correctly recognizes a kind of Brechtian, uh, as in Bertolt Brecht, Brechtian assignment of magical aura to high art, what he names in square, square, scare quotes as, quote, autonomous work of art, and the implicit designation of such art, pro forma, as counter-revolutionary, simply wholly on the wrong side so to speak. Adorno agrees with Benjamin and Breck that a magical aura persists in the bourgeois artwork, pointing out that he has long criticized this very feature. But here he separates himself from Benjamin by insisting that the artwork is not only magically erotic, but rather is inherently dialectical. That is, it, quote, compounds within itself the magical element with the sign of freedom, unquote. In a later letter to Benjamin, that uh, was in November 10, 1938, from New York, likewise connected to their running dispute, but this time concerning Benjamin's manuscripts, quote, the Paris of the Second Empire in Baudelaire, unquote. Part of the never-completed arcades projects Adorno put the matter succinctly. He says, quote, Unless I am very much mistaken, your dialectic is lacking in one thing, mediation. Unquote. Thus, with regard to autonomous artwork, artworks, Adorno reminds Benjamin of his own, quote, emphatic endorsement of the primacy of technology, especially music, unquote, as a means to transform this art as well by defetishizing it. He suggests that the, quote, pursuit of the technical laws of autonomous art, unquote, the rigorous application of the compositional process, processes of new music, such as the 12-tone technique, are the means to this end. So here, in this case, Adorno is promoting the atonal, the avant-garde, form of art and art music. Adorno rejects the absolute nature of Benjamin's position. Quote, the reification of a great work of art is not simply a matter of loss any more than the reification of the cinema is or loss. In other words, the dialectic technique must be applied to the law as well as to the high art. Thus Adorno insists that cinema itself possesses aura to an extreme and highly suspect degree. The cult of stars, the site, not the neighborhood theater, but the movie palace and advertising hype, movie magazine trailers. So here we have Adorno basically saying that it's the commercialization of the film work that is the problem. Adorno acknowledges the damage of artworks in commodity culture just as he insists on the commodification of mass art. Both high and low, quote, bear the stigmata of capitalism. Both contain elements of change, but never, of course, simply as a middle term between Schomburg and the American film. Both are torn halves of an integral freedom to which, however, they do not add up." Unquote. 
Adorno accuses Benjamin of romanticizing, placing what he names, quote, blind trust in the spontaneous power of the proletariat, which is itself lamentably a product of bourgeois society, unquote. That is, Adorno wonders aloud about the nature of the magic that will suddenly allow the downtrodden to become enlightened in the manner prescribed by Benjamin through watching through watching movies. Nazi cinema, sharp in his mind, cinema which Benjamin knew as well, suggests that Benjamin's enthusiasm is not warranted. Adorno then speaks of audience laughter which he, like Benjamin, has heard in the cinema. He finds it, quote, anything but salutary and revolutionary, unquote, naming that uh, what he hears, quote, bourgeois sadism, unquote, not fundamentally different, say, from Jerry Springer audiences taking exquisite pleasure in the misery and self-shaming behavior of others. But with respect to the little tramp, talking about Charlie Chaplin here, the idea that a reactionary individual can be transformed into a member of the avant-garde through an intimate acquaintance with the films of Chaplin strikes me as simple romanticization. You need only have heard the laughter of the audience at the screening of this film to realize what is going on." Unquote. Benjamin's artwork essay addresses photography and film, Adorno via the fetish character essay and responding to Benjamin addresses music. Whereas Benjamin's political theory of mass art argues for its liberating tendencies, Adorno's essay opens with a statement about mass consciousness and obedience. Both writers' essays speak to issues of production and consumption, but their emphasis is different. Arguably, Benjamin is more concerned with the question of audience consumption, whereas Adorno is more directly focused on production. Benjamin speaks in detail about how audiences receive mass art. Adorno speaks in detail about what they are given to consume. And his examples come from both the classical and popular repertoire both commodified and by various means standardized, as he will argue. His point being to suggest that Benjamin's utopian conclusion is unwarranted and dangerously myopic as regards the very politics he espouses. Adorno's overriding critique is based on what he regards as the standardized nature of what he names, quote, musical goods, unquote art reduced to product. He suggests that people listen to music as, before the fact, so much music, which is to say that they barely listen at all, and precisely because they don't need to. They already know what they will hear, even before they hear it. And he ironically adds, quote, Schomburg's music resembles popular songs in refusing to be enjoyed. Unquote. Of course, Adorno here is emphasizing the avant-garde nature of Schoenberg's music as being the music that uh, uh, one, of course, is forced to listen to attentively and uh, not as music. Adorno is building toward an argument for contemplative listening which he does not perceive as a passive exercise, focused on musical structure uh, standards, standardization, Adorno argues, is driven by imitation, which, by repeating, in essence, uh, musically speaks against the foundation of originality upon which individuality depends. The liquidation of the individual is the real signature of the new musical situation. Rather than the individual liberated by Benjamin, Adorno's larger claim is that all contemporary musical life is commodity dependent. There is no fundamental difference between the marketing of the three tenors and the backstreet boys, nor the music 
each group performs. Indeed, not even their performance venues are markedly different. Quote, the consumer is really worshipping the money that he himself has paid for the ticket to the Toscanini concert, unquote. That is, the more the society is governed by the exchange principle, the more that exchange value presents itself as the object of enjoyment. Conversely, Adorno commented that, quote, every pleasure which emancipates itself from exchange value takes on subversive features, unquote. Using Toscanini as his example, whose cultic star status regenerates uh, him as a fetish, Adorno critiques what he terms the, quote, barbarism of perfection, unquote, a form of fetishistic technocratic discipline and musical purity under the reign of a conductor's steely control. The result, he insists, is the loss of spontaneity to the degree that live performance already sounds recorded, in essence objectified and standardized. Quote, the new fetish is the flawlessly functioning, mechanically brilliant apparatus as such, in which all the cogwheels mesh so perfectly that not the slightest hole remains open for the meaning of the whole. The performance sounds like its own phonograph record. Unquote. The first half of the fetish character essay addresses Adorno reading of music fetishization, a critique principally centered on classical music. The last half is devoted to the regression of listening produced by music fetishization. Adorno acknowledges that with mass communications technology, millions more people have access to music. His concern, however, is that their listening is, quote, arrested at the infantile stage, unquote. A polemical comment charged uh, against what he regarded as Benjamin's suggestion that film goers became both experts and critics. Adorno, in effect, wonders how this happens, particularly when what he has consumed would, from his perspective, seem to dull nascent critical responses. Taking music like film, a time-bound art form, Adorno turns Benjamin's notion of distracted consumption on its head, in essence, to ask if one doesn't pay attention, whether because there is not much to pay heed to as per musical standardization, or because the commodified nature of music is such that the music is less important than, say, the star conductor, one doesn't hear the music, or, as he puts it, one listens only atomistically. The concentrated concentrated listening makes the perception of a whole impossible. All that is realized is what the spotlight falls on, striking melodic intervals, unsettling modulations, intentional and unintentional mistakes, or whatever condenses itself into a formula by an especially intimate merging of melody and text." Unquote. What he is after is the musical analog of TV channel surfing, in which quick surface impressions are created, but no thorough sense of any one narrative whole is developed. An analog, one could add, in which the differences among the multiple channels often extend little further than the musical parameters that distinguish uh, top 40 radio from, say, PBS great performances. So this is the crux of the matter. I mean, Adorno just doesn't see the possibility of any form of popular culture being ever, ever liberatory. Adorno outlines two broad categories of music, classical or serious, and what he terms light music. When speaking of structural listening, his concern is music whose processual complexity defines the musical 
work's essence. Adorno recognizes a functional differentiation between classical music ideally experienced by means of contemplative listening and light music, for example, its use for dancing. But here he takes a different tag in his critique. The classical music he alludes to are old works, precisely because new music has gained no place in mass consciousness and made no inroads in mass distribution. Old music is in essence fixed in time, but not fixed in reception, which has changed or, to be more precise, reverted to a mode of attending appropriate to the low common denominator of background sounds. Light music, by contrast, is new but fully standardized, locked in the narrow perimeter of self-imitation, in which instance there remains nothing to listen to. Uh, for because the listener has already heard it before its first edition. Adorno recognizes the potential for a progressive social function of both types of music, just as he insists that this function is not met by either. His argument is not about one music being inherently good and the other not, nor that the listener are inherently stupid. His claim is that listeners are made, not born, that listening is a cultural practice and that modernity has served the practice poorly by turning music, all music, to every degree possible into a thing, a market up object. Listeners, and he means all listeners, whatever their social class or educational background, are, in his words, betrayed. The betrayal's cost is charged against their own subjectivity and identity. Quote, regressive listeners behave like children. Again and again, and with start stubborn malice, they demand the one dish they have once being served. A sort of musical children's language is prepared for them. Unquote. In the end, two extremes are established. Benjamin's argument for the emancip emancipatory force of mass art and Adorno's fundamental deny denial of its actuality. Adorno maintained faith in rigorously avant-garde art, but this was art that in essence had very little, very little audience. Its impact was negligible, as well as he knew. On the other hand, Adorno confronted, as Benjamin did not, uh, the paradox of a potentially progressive political mass art. Its tendency, which he saw in Brecht, of regressive, regressing to propaganda, with the result being little better than the forms of mass art which it opposed. In other words, Adorno here is basically against Bertolt Brecht, uh, turning the theater, for instance, into a kind of socially conscious um, piece of, of propaganda. Of course, Adorno was also vehemently against what became known as Soviet art or socialist art or proletariat art. We all know that. Both Adorno's and Benjamin's essays were written in the shadow of fascism from positions of personal exile. Both men saw fascism as a symptom of a prevailing condition rather than as a political aberration. Miriam Hansen, uh, writing recently and brilliantly on the Disney references in both essays, uh, Pity Exchanges Concerning Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck, closes with the following observation, quote, Half a century later, in an age of cyborgs, global integration, and more sophisticated technological warfare, the questions posed by Benjamin and Adorno's debate on Disney are still with us, suggesting a line of inquiry that can help us defamiliarize the all-too-familiar opposition of high-modernist critique 
and postmodernist affirmation, unquote. And with that sentence, of course, one is reminded of the significance um, that Adorno um, and Benjamin, for that matter, still has on trying to make sense of modern art as well as uh, classical old art and avant-garde art. <laughs>